thing we've spoken about. We haven't mentioned about money. Right. The more I can do what I can do, that's natural to me, the more I can impact. It's like you wanting to lose weight. You don't lose weight by buying a you diet. Mean, you mean me specifically, Steve? I would or never you? be that. <laughs> you are. You look gorgeous. Thank but you. <laughs> No one loses weight by buying a diet book. They lose yeah. weight by the action. I action. I, I can honestly tell you, and this may sound arrogant and maybe a bit arsehole. I don't have any idea how much money's in my bank account. Now, that's not to say that I've got enough in there to buy Elon Musk's yacht. Absolutely not. I know that much. But I don't allow the money to control my reactions and my enthusiasm. All branding is personal. And it's not about who you say you are. It's about who you are and how you say it. I'm Hirsch Rethman, copywriter, comedian, and brand voice expert. I've helped hundreds of companies fine tune their messaging. And now I'm sitting down with some of the most ambitious and imaginative founders around who share their seven figure stories and their next figure goals. Let's hit the brand voice runway. Who is hitting the brand voice runway today? It is none other than Steve D. Sims, who has been crowned by Forbes as the real life wizard of Oz. And we will get into what makes him kind of a wizard. He is a wizard in a very magical sense in that people, no matter how big celebrities they are, whether they're a, a mono moniker name or a, a superstar with two names, it doesn't matter. Steve somehow can get in the room. And he can get his clients in the room. And that's why a lot of his clients are very high profile people as well. But we're going to talk about all kinds of things today from personal branding to how to maintain that air about you that you can really do anything. Welcome, Steve, to Brand Voice Runway. It's a pleasure to be here, but I will say I'm a little bit intimidated and nervous as where the questions are going to go. So oh, this, okay, this good. could be fun. <laughs> good. That's good. You have to be a little bit nervous. I'll ask you this question right out of the gate. Are you ever nervous, made nervous by the ask of a uh, client? No, because we've never, ever given anything that the client asked for. And that's the arrogance. <laughs> no, it, it, yeah. it sounds funny, but here's the... Wow, we're jumping straight into Branding 101. If you give the client what they want and what they ask for, you've just completed a transaction. Therefore, you've avoided communication, conversation, and any potential of loyalty. Like you look at Amazon. Amazon is probably the most perfect transactional community out there. You don't talk to it. You don't know it. It doesn't send you a birthday card. But if you want toilet roll, it's there the following day. If you are just focused on transactions, Amazon's going to put you out of business. So with me, people come to me and they go, hey, I want to do this with Journey. Hey, I want to do this with Bocelli. Oh, I want to do this with Elton John. And I literally turn around and go, really? Is that it? You know, that that's right. the, the, the top of the iceberg of your goal here? And it usually stops them. And they're like, oh, I'm like, hey, let me come back to you and let you know what I think we could do with that. And, you know, just to be brief, we had a client that wanted to meet Elton John. We got him a guitar, we got him a piano lesson and invited to his Oscar party. We had a client that wanted to meet the rock band Journey backstage. I actually put him on stage and he sang four tunes with the rock band Journey. And I had a client that wanted to go to the most amazing restaurant in Florence. I thought that was dull. So I closed down the Academia de Galleria, set up a table of six at the feet of Michelangelo's David, and then for shits and giggles, while they're tucking into that tiramisu, I brought in Andre Bocelli to serenade them. So I've never given a client anything that they've asked for. I've given something that they desired, but they maybe just didn't know it was possible. So essentially, Steve, what happens is they you look at it from the point of view of their, what they say is really the starting point, the kernel of the idea for you. Yes, 100%. And then you set your sights on an idea. Now, at that point, What's the difference between executing an idea where there's, you know, somebody says, look, sky's the limit. I want to meet Elton John. And they just, they, money's no object. And saying, here's a really interesting idea. Here's something nobody's ever done before, but I have to do some stuff to get it done. It's not just about writing a check. So you're focusing on the execution. Okay. 
Yeah. If you think of anyone out there that's ever done anything that has disrupted the planet, Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, Larry Page, you know, there, there's millions of people out there. They didn't start with the execution because that's looking at the shovel. They looked at the size of the hole they wanted. They looked at the end goal. Steve Jobs wanted, do you remember his, um, his iTunes? His yeah. iTunes play he was like, I want all my music to fit in this. Right. I want the computer in world to fit in that. I want all of my connections to fit in that. He didn't know how to do it. He just knew what the end of goal was. And, and then uh, you had Elon Musk come along and go, Hey, I want to live on Mars and I want to go up into space at an affordable and repeatable rate. Now yeah. we just have to look at how it's done. Larry Page, same thing with Google. So with me, what I do is, okay, you want this. What's the most, and people don't do this today. And this is where people go wrong. What's the most ridiculous, stupid goal, dream, creation that with no hindrance or parameters I could come up with? Now, I'm going to tell you, you may turn around and go, well, I'd like to arrive on a floating carpet. Well, you know, Hollywood, we can create a floating carpet that it would look and give you the experience. But the point is that people are just that constraint and they don't allow that creativity to go out there. So start off with a stupid dream, a ridiculous, laughable goal, and then go, okay, how do I get there? And then you reverse into the engineering of how it needs to happen. And I will say some of the times you go, oh, I want Beyonce to float in on a pink elephant, and I want Elton John to be on the piano, and then I want, you know, I know the temptations to bounce out of a cake. And you may get, well, they're not available. They can't do this. You can't get them all together. They're not trapped. You can't afford it. Well, okay, those are parameters. But if you start off with no parameters, you dream bigger and you you achieve greater. Yeah. And when you were starting out, I'd like to hear a little bit about from the, as I mentioned, you know, we always think about things through the prism of image, brand image. That's why you're such an exciting guest to have on, because everything you do is about presentation, about the details, about the impact. So that is your brand. But your brand, as I mentioned about your website, your brand is not just that. It isn't just tell me what you want and I'm a magician and I can get it done. It's very bold and it's kind of no bullshit. It's kind of, you know, it's don't come here if you want to be, you know, babied per se. How did you go about building that image? How did your (laughs) brand image evolve? This is hilarious. I love this question. I've never gone down this path before. So congratulations on doing that. So, well, uh, boastfully, I'm a speaker, author, two times author, coach, all of that kind of stuff. But when I started in the luxury world of what I was, was a luxury Mr. Fix-It for rich, powerful people in the planet, here's why that question makes me laugh. I hated and was terrified of branding. So what did I do? I avoided it like it was the plague. And this is what I mean. Back in the 80s and the 90s, when you met someone that had money, you were treated differently. You know, back then, he'd be like, oh, good afternoon, sir. How are you? You almost became British when you were talking (laughs) to someone out of mind. It was ridiculous, but that was, look, a pretty woman, the movie. Classic example, you know? Now, you see someone with money, and they're wearing sneakers that look all ripped up, and they are ripped up, but they just happen to be, you know, $5,000 design of ripped up sneakers. It seems as though now we try to look like a bum. But back then, you were treated differently. Now. I looked at me, 245 pound of biker ugly. I don't have a car. I'm on a motorcycle. I don't speak the Queen's English. I'm an East London boy. I've got tattoos, piercings. I'm I'm a big lad. This isn't good for a brand. Not (laughs) when you are trying to deal with the apparently elite of the planet where you've got to come over and dazzle them with stories of, well, I was in Monaco and I'm in Paris and I didn't have it. I knew I could do and help, but I thought to myself, I don't look what this kind of character looked like. I look more like your security guard. Yeah. So in which case, I didn't fit the perception. And a lot of people link perception to brand. I say to you, stockbroker, attorney, realtor, you get these images, gardener, you get these images come up yeah. in your head. 
Well, I didn't fit that parameter. So what did I do? I avoided it. I wouldn't get in any photographs. I never had a website. I would never do any of this. But one of the statements you made was that my website is no bullshit and focuses on the impact. Well, at the time, because I didn't have a brand and I didn't want you to realize how you know, inarticulate I was and how I didn't know big words and how I couldn't spell big words, I went for brevity. How can I help? What do you need? When do you want this done by? My, my conversations were definitely short. And people came up with, look, if you speak to Steve, he's a no bullshit kind of guy. Right, right. Bear in, bear in mind, I'm trying to hide how uneducated I was. Right. I didn't right. want you having a half hour conversation with me. True story. Someone asked me, I lived in Hong Kong, which is a whole new story. And someone said to me about working on something in Monaco. I phoned up my dad in London when I lived in Hong Kong to ask him where Monaco was. Uh-huh. I, we, we didn't have Google at the time. Do you know what he did? He put me on the phone with someone else because he didn't even know. Yeah. So I was having short conversations because I didn't want to reveal anything. So my, my, my strength was in the brevity. What it created was this, he's a guy on a bike, you know, it'll, it'll fuck you up rather than talk to you for too long. So be careful with him. But hey, if you want it done, <laughs> this is the guy that will do it. So one thing weirdly happened as I was trying to avoid branding, because I didn't fit the 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 mold of what a Mr. Fix-It, highfalutin, world-traveling connector looked like, I was actually establishing my own brand. And I remember there was a friend of mine who was a, a biker, and this actually was in Miami, and he was a brilliant artist, really creative. And I said to him, okay, I'm doing really well with this company now. I need you to design an image for me. And like all idiots... We're like, and it needs to look like this, and it needs to do this, and needs yeah, to. Yeah. I, I gave him all the instructions, which were devilishly misleading. And he presented to me, and he said, Oh, by the way, this is you. And I looked at it, and I was like, Well, it's not me. And this was obviously before AI. It's a caricature who I think people want to meet rather than meeting me. And I'm like, eh, there's a disconnect there. And he went, by the way, while you're looking at that, this is you. And there was just a picture of me with my arms crossed. Mm -hmm. And I realized at the time, branding is to not surprise the person you're having the conversation with. The worst people at it are realtors. Because you look at a, a board, you see a house, you go, oh, I like that. And there's this young woman on there with like flowing blonde hair. And you, you phone up and you book a time to look at this house. And this 90-year-old woman turns up. And you think, she's, <laughs> you think to yourself, and, and I know a bunch of you out there have had this happen. It happened to me with the house that I currently live in. You know, the picture looked like she was 30. She turned up, she's 90. And I went, oh, I saw the picture. And she was like, yeah, I've always loved that picture. But here's yeah. the thing. I'm with my wife and my kids. I want to buy a house. I don't want to date you. I want to buy a house. <laughs> but you've already lied to me about who you are. You've already hidden behind this 30-year-old picture. So in my head, without right. her speaking to me, I'm going, hang on. You've lied about who you are. What else are you going to lie about? Yeah. So when you focus on brevity and impact and go, hey, I do this and I hit that nail. Or I do this and I fix that. You don't give the ability for anyone to be confused about who you are. Now, if they want to walk away from you because you're big, ugly, scary, hey, great. That's called filtering. Good. I'd rather save the time now than actually discover in six months' time that you'd scared shitless of me. So if I can present me as bold and as strong as I can possibly be now, then I know we're going to be able to communicate. Yeah, that last part is the, perhaps the best part of what you said, because it's the image is Elvis Presley said in an interview once the image is one thing and the man is another. And it's very hard to live up to an image. And the problem with that was that the image that was put out there was everything that anyone could ever imagine or dream of, not anything that he was, even him. And he was plenty, but it wasn't 
you know, when you put out there that they're perfect and they're role model and they're this and they're that, it's you can't live up to it. And there's only disappointment. And I, you know, this is aligned with my principle, my core principle, which is selling the truth. You know, you have to work with what's real to you, what's your truth and what you really are. That's what you have to work with. You don't have to work with what you wish you were because the client's never going to trust you. It's like you said, I learned that in stand-up comedy too, doing stand-up comedy. I used to do impressions and one of the MCs said to me, don't open with impressions anymore. Don't open with like even dialects, just be yourself for a couple of minutes so that the audience will trust you. And it makes perfect sense. So when you come on strong, you're coming on just as strong as you are. And, you know, if they buy it and they like it and they're into it, you can work together. One question is, so now you've been doing this, you have been in this area of the business for how long? You started out doing the luxury stuff. Yeah, this was so the late 90s. I just started helping people get into clubs, bars and restaurants that were sold out just to start being able to talk to wealthy people. And it got bigger and bigger. And I ended up getting them into like award shows and sporting facilities and then getting them in with celebrities and rock stars. And it just grew and grew and grew. And then I stopped doing this probably about eight years ago when I launched my first book called Blue Fishing, the art of uh, the art of making things happen. And then last year released my second book, Go For Stupid, The Art of Achieving Ridiculous Goals. And between that, I just got booked on stages to speak and coach. And the idea now is I focus on how to get your brand articulate and out there, how to get you exposed to be the individual unicorn that you are and what is the solution that you provide and who has the problem. So my world's changed slightly from spending billionaires' money to now getting you in a position that you can earn the money to do what you like. Well, that is kind of the the progression. That's another thing we talk about on the show. You know, every brand has, you know, everybody's someplace. You know, some some people are six-figure brands, some people are seven or eight, but there's a next figure. There's another thing that they want. And what I've been stressing when I'm, as I kind of launch this show, is that it isn't always dollars. It isn't, the, the higher you get, in fact, the next figure tends to be something more personal and something more meaningful. And you had mentioned that you have your sites set on standards and sharing. Yeah. You would use that phrase. So, and you, you touch on it, but tell me a little bit about that. I'm a great believer in standards. And the sad thing is, I think that as a, we don't like conflict, which is really weird because we perpetuate it on an hourly basis. Yeah. But we're actually not good with conflict. So when we go into a store and we get a bag of fries or we get a drink or we get a coffee and it's, a, it's not really you know fresh or the, the fries are a little bit chilly, rather than us turning around and going, oh, excuse me, you know, I think I got the last of the old batch. Could you give me a fresh batch? It's not like that paying for them. But instead of you doing that, you just take them and sit in the corner and go, oh, bloody hell, these, these fries are cold while you digest them. So I'm all about standards. And one of the first things I teach is standards. Now, when you demand better of yourself, you demand more of what you can give of yourself. So your coaching gets better. Your podcasts get better. When you demand more for you, you demand more from you. So I'm a great believer in perpetuating those standards. In fact, I heard about a a good one the other day from a friend of mine, Jesse Itzler, and he was saying that if you run a 100-meter race with people that you can beat, you'll always win. Yeah. But if you run that race against people that are better than you, you'll always lose. But your ability and your timing will increase. Because you rise with standards. So quite simply, I'm all about finding people in my room that hold a better standard than me and go into them. And as soon as I get that standard, that's my new normal. Now I'm looking for the next one. So I'm a great believer in, can I rise up, get the right room, constantly increase your standards. And if you focus on those, and I repeat that a lot, I should have a tattoo with it. (laughs) If you focus on your standards, people want to be part of it. People want to live to your standards. They want to rise to you and to be part of what you expect. So it's a great thing to adopt. And again, 
How much does it cost you to just go, excuse me, these fries are chilled, you know, or the, the coffees, you know, can I have one from the fresh pot? Just being polite and asking something like that, you get treated differently and you treat yourself differently. Well, I'll tell you this. I'll confess this. When we had, before we got on the uh, on the air, we had a little mix up with the scheduling and uh, I accommodated the, the switch and just whatever. It's nobody's, no thing. But as soon as I got on camera with you before we were recording, but as soon as I got on Zoom with you, you were extremely gracious, extremely polite, apologetic about any particular mix of all of that stuff. And I immediately was like, OK, I totally get why Steve is why he's able to accomplish what he accomplishes, because he's just got that part of his brain that tells him, you know, the right way to act the right. You know, it's just it's everything set to the right calibration. I hope that came out right. It's definitely a compliment. But and, and I, I appreciate it. But the thing that's actually pissing me off about it, it, and it is, you're actually aggravating me. The reason you're aggravating me is because oh, I know. Shouldn't, shouldn't that be how everyone yes. is? Yes. Yes. You I sent me an invite. By my mistake, I hadn't put it in there. And I was, I hate letting anyone down. I had a phone call with someone this morning. They were 15 minutes late. I left the call. They turned up 20 minutes later. They went, oh, I'm here now. And I was like, so was I. We're not having the call. So my yeah. standards are like, you know, I'm five and done. You're five minutes late. I'm out. I let you down. And in turn, I let myself down. So me apologizing should be nothing that should be called on as special. It should be right, expected right. from you. But today we're surprised by people that turn up on time or do a good job or put a hard day's work in. It's amazing what we're settling for as, again, these new standards. Yeah, very good point, Steve. I'm glad I opened the door for you to underscore the point. <laughs> the fact <laughs> is, man, that is true. We yeah. have adjusted our expectations. And that's and I'm so glad that it came up because it's not something that I've addressed on the show heretofore. It's not like uh, a, a, a drum that I beat, but it is so true. And in the in the context of people listening to this and wanting to grow their image, grow their brand, it's one thing to, to you know, some people have an inflated idea of their self-worth or whatever. I think we have the opposite problem in today's society, and you're kind of tapping into that. People don't think enough of themselves. Mm -hmm. We don't think we're worth enough or worthy enough. And that alone is, you know, is something that we can undo ourselves, you know, with that kind of thinking. So in that case, I will caution you never to screw up again. Don't mess with me again, mate. You could end <laughs> I, up. I won't. I won't. I wouldn't, I wouldn't dare do it. Yeah, you wouldn't dare, would you? And let's do this. So, I mean, I really enjoy speaking with you. I will probably, when I have some, I am planning some specials where I have a single question and I invite a handful of former guests in to address these questions. You're definitely going to be on that list if you'll accept it. But accepted. Um, thank you. Thank you, mate. So, okay. So as we circle back around, we want to give the audience something to ruminate on. And we, we already have. What would you say to people who are scared of dreaming too big right now. Like I think a lot of people won't look ahead. They won't take their, lift their head up. What do you say to people who who are holding back on a dream is probably the better way to phrase it. Well, the shallow thing would be to tell them to grab my book, go for stupid, but then that would be really crass. So I wouldn't do that. No, no. <laughs> no one that's done anything did it by listening to anyone else. And I'm a great believer, and it's a beautiful woman, Sally Hogshead, that mentioned it. She said, different is better than better. We're all different. We all stand out. We're all unique. But then we spend a lot of effort and time trying to conform and fit in. So I would really ask yourself, if you are trying to define a brand, and let's be blunt, they're not going to be listening to your podcast if they're not. So you obviously have the aggravation. You obviously have the desire. You want that ability to be able to define your own brand. We'll define it by not trying to be somebody else's. So first of all, you know, do you look like the caricature 
of your industry. And if you do, focus on being different, not better. I'm going to keep, when you get to the level that you're at now, do you think about, other than in your day-to-day and how you carry yourself, do you think about marketing yourself? Or is it kind of done at this point? You're going to get calls in, you're going to get referrals and things, you're going to get asked to do stuff. (laughs) I think there's a misconception that, you know, you get to a certain point and the world opens and you do less. You get to a certain point where you focus on doing more of what you're brilliant at and the less of the stuff that you can outsource. The argument is like, I'm shit at invoicing. I don't, I don't think I've touched an invoice for 70, 17 years. Crap at accounting. Really terrible at banking. So I don't do any of these things. I have a group of people that allow me more time in my day to do more of what my unicorn is. And if you notice anything that we've spoken about, we haven't mentioned about money. Right. The more I can do what I can do, that's natural to me, the more I can impact. It's like you wanting to lose weight. You don't lose weight by buying a do you diet. Mean, you mean me specifically, Steve? I would or never you? be that. <laughs> you, are, you look gorgeous. Thank but you. No, no one loses weight by buying a diet book. They lose yeah. weight by the action. I action. I, I can honestly tell you, and this this may sound arrogant and maybe a bit arsehole, I don't have any idea how much money's in my bank account. Now, that's not to say that I've got enough in there to buy Elon Musk's yacht. Absolutely not. I know that much. But I don't allow the money to control my reactions and my enthusiasm. I can now get involved in people, products, services, podcasts, Anything out there because I want to. I had a lady the other day was speaking to me about speaking on her stage. And I was able to have the conversations about, well, who are the people? You know, who's going to be there? Why are the keynote speakers in there? I was able to converse about the event. And once yeah. we had both decided that it was a fit, I passed it over to our accounting team to actually go over the boring stuff, such as payment. Yeah, And that's how your life should be. Don't focus on the stuff that binds you down. Focus on the stuff that explodes you with creativity and enthusiasm and mostly impact. Now, a lot of people can't wait for that moment. I totally get that. And everybody get, you know, do your magic, you know, do uh, do your magic. That's Now, what about the people who are still kind of bootstrapping a little bit? They have to do some of these things, but they already know their shit at it. Yep. They hate it. They even think maybe it's impacting their business. Maybe it's whole, maybe it's not, but they can't afford a group of people yet. You know, they have to do some of those things. Some of them, you know, they got rid of a couple of things. What do you tell them? I got, you're really good at this. You know, oh, I tell you, you I'm going to I'm going <laughs> to subscribe to your podcast because I really like the questions that you're coming out with. Thank you. Man. And here's my answer. This is what Tuesdays and Thursdays are for. Now, there is that time before the tipping point. And here's a funny thing. You may find that a lot of people listening to this are actually in that tipping point now. They're just not recognizing it or that frightened to take it. So this is what you do. You've got a Monday, Wednesday and a Friday to do the shit you don't want to do in your day the accounting, the marketing, the promotion, the social, whatever. On the Tuesday and the Thursday, just focus on your unicorn. Anything else, which is the boring stuff that you have to do, hey, there's a Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for that. And so on that Tuesday and Thursday, you live the life and person that you want to be. You only do phone calls with prospects. You only do coaching calls. You only talk about speaking gigs. You only do the marketing, the creative, anything that you are superior at. You do on a Tuesday and a Thursday, but the Monday, Wednesday and a Friday, you do the other stuff plus that. And then eventually what will happen is your flip. Then the Monday, Wednesday and a Friday, that's your unicorn. And on the Tuesday and the, the Thursday, you do invoicing or you do fulfillment or you do the other side. And so what you do is you flip them to the point where you turn around and go, OK, now I'm only going to do the shit on a Thursday because on a Tuesday, I've outsourced that. And that's yeah. what I did. It was actually a, a mentor of mine that said, flip your unicorn. So I started doing Monday, Wednesday and Friday, my normal days. But on the Tuesday and the Thursday, 
I didn't focus on, oh, this, this telephone bill has got to be paid. That's what a Wednesday's for. I'll pay attention to it tomorrow. But today, I'm creating. And your team suddenly start realizing, and I used to have my team. Bear in mind, my team was my wife and my son. All right. So I'm not talking about I had 50 million people around me. But then as I started employing people, it'd be like, no, no, no. We don't disturb him on that today because it's a Thursday. Mm -hmm. He handles that on a Friday. You know, oh, there's some, oh, a new lease has to be negotiated. Hey, that's what Mondays are for. Leave him be, you know? And that's how it was. And then eventually I got left alone completely where I just literally didn't touch any of that shit. Yeah. Oh, that's what a great answer. Now I see why you love the question, because that's a fantastic answer, Steve. Well, it really is because it was a brilliant question. That's why I keep recording. See that? (laughs) I break up the thing a little bit, but I keep the, I've learned my lesson, you know, but I used to do, what I used to do is get so wrapped up in the details of those other things. And I didn't, with me, it wasn't accounting because I was like, at least that prescient that I was like, okay, I'm not even doing that, but I would do other things. And I was like administrative things, things that didn't need it. And it would get so overwhelming that when the event or whatever the thing was came around, I wasn't really there. You know, I was there at 70% and that's when I was needed to be at a hundred percent, not a hundred percent on a reviewing a contractor or or calling a, you know, the pop-up, the, whatever you call it, the, the red carpet people to set up the, 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 you know, it's like, whatever, you can't manage everything either. You can't, ma- quality is, doesn't come actually, in uh, micromanagement. I actually used to do some work with this little little car company called Ferrari for Formula yeah. One. And I met a guy once and he was a former Ferrari racing driver for F1. And we were down in Monaco and we're chatting about, and there was the engine there. And they had the back of the plastic off. And so you could just see this bloody engine. And it was just, I I, I wouldn't know where to start on this thing. It just looked insane. And I said to him, what's that? And he looked at me and he went, fuck knows. He said, I'm the driver, not the mechanic. (laughs) He he said to me, first thing, know your place. Yeah. And I was like, all right, that makes total sense to me. You know, I'm the driver, not the mechanic. You're the mechanic, not the driver. So you've got to realize that, You may be doing those things you have to do now because, hey, you're growing your business, but you need to recognize that they are not you. Now, what you do, but they are not you. You are you, your unicorn. If you're fantastic at communication, if you're fantastic at making that pot, painting that picture, looking after the pets, that's your unicorn. The marketing, the accountability, the brand, you can get other people to do that. Yeah. I should have learned this lesson sooner because one of the things my dad used to do, my dad was an attorney, but he very handy, very busy around the house. You know, my sisters would leave jewelry on his desk to be fixed when they broke something. And I remember him helping a friend out and fixing the air conditioner, doing something with it. And the guy saying, I think I hear like a, there's a little ticking going through the thing as the fan spins. And my dad said, I think you need a better lawyer. (laughs) <laughs> you know, <laughs> if you don't like the job I'm doing, get a better lawyer because that's what he is, not an air conditioner repair man. So yeah. I think it's okay to help out. And it's okay to pitch in. But like you say, know your place. Yeah. Um, well, Steve, this has been fantastic. I hope it's the first of many, many conversations that we have. I just really enjoy speaking with you and I appreciate your time on the show. It's been an absolute honor and a pleasure to be here. Thanks, pal. If you've enjoyed this episode of Brand Voice Runway, please leave a five-star review and subscribe to the podcast. The positive reinforcement keeps us going. Who am I kidding? Founders like us keep going regardless. Thanks so much for listening and make tomorrow greater than today.